Hello, this video is part of a series on the Bullbuster community on nighttime sword fishing. This video is very comprehensive. It's broken down into nine sections. And by the end of this video, you're going to know everything you need to know about nighttime sword fishing. We're going to talk about the gear you need to successfully land a big swordfish. We're going to talk about the tackle, and that includes the, the hooks, the line, and the terminal tackle. We're going to talk about what baits to use and how to rig them. We're going to talk about how to set up your drift, how to know when you have a hit, tips for fighting big swords, a few techniques that really aren't mainstream yet but will help you catch more swordfish, the science of swordfish because understanding this is going to truly make you a better fisherman, and at the end of the day you're going to catch your swordfish and you're going to want to cook it. So we're going to show you a few recipes here that should help you cook your swordfish. Alright, so let's start with the gear. If you're going to land a big swordfish, you're going to need gaffs. Now, not everyone's going to go out there and spend like almost $1,000 on like a harpoon and a big flying gaff, but uh, if you're just getting started, you're going to want at least two to three gaffs on your boat, and you're definitely going to want some gloves. The, re the reason that you want gloves is out of all the billfish, the swordfish has the sharpest bill, right, the swordfish, uh, but it is the sharpest bill and it will damage you. As a matter of fact, uh, if you can see in this picture here, we landed a about a 20 pound sword and this thing was very very green and literally almost chopped off my finger so you know a lot of these tips I'm giving you from mistakes that we've made that we've learned from and uh, yeah definitely wear gloves when fighting the swordfish when bringing it up now if you're gonna go after really big swords and you know there's big you know 300 400 500 plus pounders out there so if you want to target these and you're serious about that and you want to be successful at it go ahead and get a flying gaff and get a harpoon. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Uh, it's actually going to be safer for you and your crew if you have these. All right, so let's get into the reels. You're going to want at least four to six 50 to 80 pound class reels. So that's 50 wides and 80 wides. And the reason you're going to want four to six is this is what you're going to need to set up a good drift. As far as fishing line goes and spooling these reels, you're going to want to have at least 500 yards of 80 pound braided backing and I would go with an 80 pound monofilament top shot on top of that. A lot of times your fish are going to be getting into the backing and a lot of times you're going to actually have to chase your swordfish but you're going to want to have time to bring in all your all your buoys everything and chase your swordfish before you get spooled you know there's it's very deep out there so you need a lot of line capacity because unless you're chasing a fish there is a potential to get spooled. A lot of people keep a set of rod and reels specifically for swordfish and that's because you need to set up your reels specifically to do nighttime drifts and one of the ways that you do this is you make uh, wax thread floss loops uh, different marks in different depths so a standard depth would be maybe 100 feet 200 feet and 300 feet and you might want to have each reel marked out to how you want to use it is it going to be a tip rod is it going to be a buoy rod etc so uh, one thing you can do is put a piece of tape or something that you know doesn't damage your reel as much and make a mark and say this this rod is marked at 100 feet this rod is marked at 200 feet this rod is marked at 300 feet and we'll go into this a little bit more in depth later uh, but that's why a lot of people have swordfish setups that are or reels and rods that are just specifically for swordfish all right so the next thing we're going to cover is making a basic swordfish buoy you're going to want at least four to six of these on your boat when you're nighttime sword fishing. There's a number of different types of buoys that you can use, and we'll include some videos on how to make those. But the one that we're going to show you in this video is really the simplest one and one of the most effective buoys that you can make for nighttime sword fishing. So here's a list of the materials that you're going to need. You're going to need four to six milk jugs, four to six glow sticks, four to six long line clips, a coil of 300 pound Bulbuster Grander Leader, uh, some crimps for that 300 pound Bulbuster Grander Leader, and some crimpers. Alright, so the best type of milk jug for this situation is you're going to want the, the plastic one with the handle. And it's very simple to do this. You're going to take 300 pound Bulbuster Grander monofilament, and you're going to put that around the handle, and then you're going to crimp your long line clip to it. You're going to open it up, and you're going to throw your glow stick inside, you're going to close it up, and you have a swordfish buoy. Alright, so now we're going to talk about making a basic nighttime swordfish rig. So, you're going to start out with a six foot section 
of 300 pound bulbous or granulator. You don't need anything much longer. You want that fish within range of your gaff, within range of everything, uh, when you're bringing it up to the boat for you know better handling. Uh, sometimes you're going to want to use a wind down later, but let's get back to this rig. So you're going to have a six foot section of bulbous or grander later. Uh, you're going to make a loop at the top uh, because you're going to be sna using a snap swivel to connect that. At the end of this rig, you're going to connect a 11 J hook. And from there, you're going to want to take some electrical tape. You're going to connect a, a, p a glow stick halfway between your swivel and your hook. And along your swivel, you're going to include a, a, an electric light. Uh, it could be a flasher, or different types of light. Now, when you're letting this rig out, you've already rigged your squid. You're probably going to let at least 30 feet of line out. And then you're going to take a, a 12 ounce weight and you're going to connect it to your line. I like using a rubber band because when that fish comes up, you can rip that weight right off. and It's not going to hit you in the head. There's a lot of action going on when that's happening. And it could be dangerous to have a, a, a 16 ounce, a 12 ounce, or a 32 ounce weight just swinging in the air. When that fish comes close, you're going to grab that weight, you're going to yank it off, you're going to break the rubber band. Now, the reason that you're going to want to put your weight so far away from your rig is it's going to give it a better float. Uh, if you have a live bait, it's going to get a, give it better swimming action. If you have a squid, it's just going to drift a lot better. Uh, we found that just from a lot of drifts and a lot of sword fishing. Now, you might want to switch up this rig a little bit if you're going to be fishing live baits. A lot of times you're going to want to use a smaller hook on the live bait rig. If you're going to want to bring it down to like a 9-0 hook, something that you can bridle the fish with. So you're going to be bridling either goggle eyes, blue runners, tinker mackerel, small bonita, or speedos. And you're going to want to take a rigging needle and some rubber bands. And you're going to want to bridle your bait right in the top of the nose so you have some great swimming action and that hook is sticking right out. Actually, the biggest swordfish I've ever seen caught and, and was a part of was actually foul hooked when it chased the blue runner. You want that hook sticking out as much as you can so you can have the best hookup ratio possible. All right, so now we're going to talk about setting up a basic nighttime swordfish drift. For this drift, we're going to have five rods. We're going to have three buoy rods, and we're going to have two what we call tip rods. So let's start with the buoy rods. Remember those buoys we made with the milk jugs? Well, that's going to go on each one of the buoy rods. So buoy rod number one. You're going to hook up the buoy to, to the, you know, the wax thread that we made there. Let's say this one's at 100 feet. So you're going to clip the long line clip from the buoy to the 100 foot marker after you've let your bait down. You're going to drop this buoy in the water and you're going to drive your boat about 50 to 100 yards. Then you're going to clip buoy number two. The whole time you're letting buoy number one out. You're going to clip buoy rod number two. It's a long line clip. Let's say this one's at 200 feet. So you have your 200 foot marker. You're going to clip your long line clip to that marker and you're going to keep driving your boat out. Keep driving your boat out. Let's say you let it out another 50 yards. Uh, so you have your, your first buoy's at 150 yards, your second buoy's at 50, 50 yards. Now you're going to put buoy number three. You're going to clip it to line line clip. Let's say this one's at 300 feet. So your bait's 300 feet down. You clip the long line clip onto there and you're going to drive another 50 to 100 yards. So now you have a a spread. You have three buoys that are spread out, you know, well away from the boat. And now you're going to work on your tip rods. So what are your tip rods? Your tip rods are literally straight down from the tip. No buoys. So you're going to probably going to, you're going to want to put one tip rod between buoy rod number one and buoy rod number two. Oh, by the way, uh, the description that we're doing here is for a center console boat. So, you, you know, you have your boat drifting. So you're going to put your tip rod between buoy rod number one and number two, and you're going to let it down. A lot of people let their tip rods down a little bit deeper. Uh, but let's just say for tip rod number one, a lot of swordfish hits happen at the 100, 150 foot mark. It just happens, and it depends on the moon phase, and we can talk about that later in the sword fishing science section. So let's say let, all right, tip rod number one goes down 150 feet. Now we take tip rod number two, we're going to send it way deep because, you know, we already have all these parts of the, of the water column covered. So let's say we're going to put tip rod number two. It's between rod buoy number two and buoy number three. And this is just to prevent tangles. So let it down 400 feet. And there you have a 
great basic swordfish drift setup. You have your baits well spread apart, you're not going to get tangled, and now it's time to get down to business. How do we find a bite? Alright, so you set up your basic nighttime swordfish drift. Uh, you've got your baits out there. Now there's two different types of hits. And the first one is, is probably the most obvious. It's your reel's just sitting there, and all of a sudden it just goes... And it doesn't stop. That's an exciting hit. That's awesome. It gets the adrenaline pumping, and you're ready to go. You know what you need to do. Start clearing all the other rods and focus on this fish. So here's the second type, and this is really important to know and to keep a lookout for because this is a more complex bite. So you have all these buoys out there, it's nighttime, and all of a sudden, you know, you have your flashers down on your rigs and, and the glow sticks. Uh, all of a sudden, you see a glow stick or just a light, a green light, and it's going to be going, it's like close to the surface, and it's going across the surface, and that's a swordfish hit. Now the problem is, with this type of swordfish hit, is it's hard to know which type, which rod it was that got hit. So a lot of times it's a buoy rod, so it could be the one that's all the way out there. And your swordfish just picked up your bait and just swam right towards the boat. So the first thing you're going to do when you see this, or first of all, this is a swordfish, without a doubt. When you see a light going across the surface, you have a swordfish on. Now, how to figure out which rod it is. So you're going to look at all your rods, you're going to start reeling on them. The one that is loose, 90% of the time, that's the rock. So you're going to you're gonna reel up the slack fast, you know, reel up the slack fast, reel up the slack fast until you get tight. So if you have a crew out there, you're going to want everyone to get on a rod and try to figure out which rod this is. But if you see a light under the surface of the water moving around, that's a swordfish and that's a hit. And you need to get on it quickly and figure out which rod it is and start clearing the other rods to fight the swordfish. Now we're going to talk about tips for fighting big swordfish. Uh, this is a swordfish, let's just say, 200, 300 pounds, 400 pound plus swordfish. Um, this is the number one tip that I have. Don't tighten your drag more than 18 pounds of drag, period. I don't care how long you've been fighting this fish. You suck it up. You finesse it because swordfish have soft mouths. So, yeah, you've been fighting it for two to three hours. You're getting exhausted. Don't get impatient. Get someone else on the rod. Uh, slow down. Don't tighten your drag more than 18 pounds of drag. You will lose the fish of a lifetime if you do this. Have patience. Okay, so here's tip number two. Sometimes your big fish is not going to come close to the boat. You can get them within 300 feet of the boat, but every time that happens, they just go on and you don't see them for another hour. You're sweating, your, your muscles are, are just like aching, uh, you're getting fatigued. Here's a trick. Turn off the lights of your boat, and it's going to let that fish come up more comfortably up to your boat when you're fighting it. Because the last thing you want is, we had, a, we had a, I think it was like a 500, 600 pound swordfish. We ended up losing the swordfish. You know, the, a lot of times these tips come from making mistakes and learning from them. So, we had a fish, it was 500, 600 pounds. And we fought it for five and a half hours. So every time the boat got with, every time the fish got within 300 feet of the boat, boom, dumped the reel. Another 500 yards out there. Another hour before we sold this fish. So one thing that you can do to to get a bigger fish closer to the boat is sometimes you can just turn off the engine, turn off the lights, and that fish doesn't know you're there. So when you're fighting it and you need to be ready, turn off your lights. It's going to come a lot closer. So, also, be ready to take a shot early in the game. You know, a lot of times you're going to get a shot within the swordfish within the first 10 minutes, within the first hour, within the first 20 minutes. Sometimes I've seen within the first 5 minutes. But what I've also seen is if you're not ready, you're going to miss that shot. And missing that shot can either be one of two things. One, you're going to lose that fish later on. Or two, you're going to be fighting that fish for another 3, 4 hours. So... Be ready early in the game to make that shot. Have your gaffs ready. Have your harpoon set up before you get out there. You know, don't waste your time. Have your gloves ready. And have your crew, if you, even if you're fishing with a new crew, on your way out and before you go fishing, explain to them the game plan. Have them understand what's going to go on because when that happens, 
you can miss a shot early in the game, and that can be the difference between catching a big fish and not catching a big fish, or catching a fish within one hour or catching them within five. So, yeah, hopefully you'll take these tips and it'll help you land bigger swordfish. Here's some tips for swordfish that have not yet gone mainstream, but help many swordfishmen catch more swordfish. So the first thing you want to do is try what we call the weightless squid. So you're going to give about 300 feet of line, and you're not going to put any weight. And what your squid's going to do is it's going to sink down, and it's going to find what's called the thermocline. That's when the temperature changes between two parts of the water. And it's actually where most of the bait fish are going to be hanging out. So this is your thermocline finder. So no weight, 300 feet of line, and a lot of swordfish are going to hit this. The second thing you want to do is you want to scale down to, if there's no bites, you want to scale down to heavy fluorocarbon. Let's say 100, uh, sorry, light fluorocarbon. Let's say 130 pound fluorocarbon. A lot of fishermen in the northeast, when they're chunking for tuna, are actually catching swordfish as bycatch. So there's no reason that this shouldn't work in you know, South Florida, in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, even out in Hawaii. Um, the next thing is make a slice into your glow stick. So take a knife and make a slice into your glow stick. It's going to start letting out this, like a, basically a trail of light, and it's, it's just going to attract more bait fish, and in turn it's going to attract more swordfish. And the other thing is you can use an artificial squid and stuff it with uh, you know, a little cheaper calamari. If you're going to go to a bait store, a full-size squid, one squid, and you need like 10 of them, are going to cost like 15 bucks a piece. So if you get, and a lot of times a swordfish is going to slash your, your squid, and you're not going to have any squid left. So try using an artificial squid. You can buy a calamari pack for about 2 bucks, shove a few squids into the artificial squid, and sew it up. And it's going to last you a lot longer. It's still going to have a scent, and it's still going to look nice the whole night, even if sharks are going by. All right, so now we're going to get into the science of swordfish. The reason that you can catch swordfish at night, that's, that's one of the, the, the crazy things about swordfish. So swordfish do what's called diurnal migrations, which means twice a day. So at at night, they're on the surface, but during the day, they're at the bottom. That's why you see all these people going daytime sword fishing, and they're, they're dropping a deep drop rig down, and they're getting these swordfish during the day all the way down to like 2,000 feet of water. But at night, the swordfish come up. Why do they do this? All right, so you have the sunlight, right? You have plankton in the water that, that come up. You have these little plankton called phytoplankton, and then you have zooplankton. So phytoplankton... Is pretty much like the grass of the ocean. It's little pieces of, of plankton that are that are plants. And at nighttime, the zooplankton isn't seen as, as much and has less predators, so it works its way up to the surface to eat the phytoplankton that's being grown uh, because the, through the sunlight, right? Plants need sunlight, and so these phytoplankton grow like grass in the in the ocean, and the zooplankton come up at night and eat them. You know, they're not as scared of being eaten. So everything else follows these, follows these zooplankton up. So then you have your herring and your squid, uh, then your, your, bigger, your smaller pelagics like mahi and all this stuff, and then you have the big swordfish that are coming up for a feast at night. So that's the reason that swordfish during the night are on the surface and during the day are, are towards the bottom. They're just following the food. Now, what do swordfish eat? The most obvious that most of us know about are squid. So that's why most of the time when you're nighttime sword fishing, you're going to be drifting a squid. But some people are surprised to, to know that a lot of swordfish have, have a ton of things in their stomach, not just squid. So you, swordfish actually, will, you'll find like shrimps and different fish like pomfret, little mahis, uh, even ribbon fish within their stomachs. Swordfish eat pretty much, they're opportunistic, they're, they're pretty big, so they can eat almost anything. They eat small tunas things like that. Uh, so, yeah, so you'll see, uh, again, the diet of swordfish is mostly squid, but you can definitely catch them with fish. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't really recommend fishing the shrimp <laughs> out on your nighttime swordfish trip, but they definitely are doing that during the day. There's a lot of crustaceans that they're just, you know, hugging along the bottom, and they're eating pretty much anything that they see. Alright, so now this isn't a very important part. So you caught the swordfish, the fight was great, you spent thousands of dollars on gear and gas, 
uh, you're going to want to eat this damn thing, right? So, so this part goes into how to cook your swordfish. There's a bunch of recipes, and I'm not going to go through a step-by-step -step, uh, talk about how to cook your swordfish. Uh, I'll, I'll include some resources for that. But I want to talk about two things about your swordfish. The first thing is there, in a, there is an immense difference in the taste between a fresh swordfish and a previously frozen swordfish. If you don't believe me, try it for yourself. Get your next swordfish that you catch, freeze a pack and eat a pack and eat, eat some that day, the day you caught it, and you will see. It's going to be hard for you to go to a restaurant and eat swordfish again because you're going to taste if it's been previously frozen. And unfortunately, a lot of times, even that $20, $30 plate of swordfish, $40, $50 plate of swordfish that you're getting is previously frozen swordfish. And it sucks, especially if you've had really good, fresh swordfish. All right, so the other thing I want to talk to you about swordfish is swordfish steaks are a lot like meat, not like fish. So it's really made, it's really good for the grill. And you're going to want to put some some seasoning on there. It's similar to what you would use for cooking a steak. You want to put some garlic on there, some teriyaki. But you know what? Go to the community, go on YouTube, look up some recipes for swordfish, and you're just going to enjoy it. Just remember, eat it fresh. Alright everyone, I hope that you enjoyed our comprehensive guide on nighttime sword fishing. And I hope that you guys catch some swordfish and send us some pictures and some stories and posts here on the Bullbuster community about catching your swordfish in the process and just some of the memories that you made while fishing for swordfish. So, we'll see you next time.